hello to everyone listening in to episode 15 of this podcast, Feldenkrais, Moving into the Unknown, podcast set up by Dale Dickens, Heidi Carroll and Libby Murray to explore human potential and how the connections between the sensory body, the cognitive mind and the emotions are expressed and integrated in our movement and behaviours. And I'd like to thank Dale for her fantastic drive and effective force and contributions so far. And I'd like to, uh, very excited to welcome today my friend Kim McGregor, uh, who will be collaborating on the podcast as it gathers momentum now and, and into the future. So hello, Kim. Hi, good morning, Libby. And it's great to have you. And uh, I suppose our quest in finding the relevancy and the applications of the Feldenkrais method for people today has uh, has really, I suppose, uh, gathered a freshness and a, a vibrancy, I think, as we present to you the guests who share the desire to embody their own true human potential and help others to do the same. So we are most delighted today and honoured to chat on this 15th episode with Leora Gaster, who has been teaching mind-body studies internationally for over four decades. So welcome, Leora. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, our, our Leora's work, there is a, a huge background and many people would be uh, aware of the connection of Leora's mother, Mia Siegel, with Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. And Leora's work is actually a synthesis of uh, the work of Moshe Feldenkrais and uh, human biology focused on the interconnection of the brain and behaviour with which Leora has a degree, uh, a biology degree from Stanford University and uh, also qualifications in neuro-linguistic programming um, and anatomy and philosophy. So uh, also an interesting fact is that Leora, like her mother Mia and Moshe Feldenkrais has a black belt in um, judo uh, from, by Kodokan in Tokyo. So um, really teaching Mind Body Studies at Mind Body Studies Academy with her mother, Mia Siegel, Leora has uh, been speaking to us about her commitment for really sharing and extending the work of Moshe Feldenkrais to make it accessible and understandable and easily teachable to people uh, of all levels and needs. So Leora offers training for practitioners and trainers at all levels and has published manuals and a program for school children and has a vast amount of recorded material, online video and audio. So at the end of the podcast, I think um, Kim will share with us some details of uh, how to access some of Leora's material. So if you're new to Feldenkrais or curious about uh, Leora's personal connection um, with Dr. Feldenkrais and her own childhood, we are going to start because we feel it's important to cover some of the historical uh, context for how Moshe Feldenkrais's work developed. So, um, you know, Leora has been very generous with her freshness and aliveness and bringing to life of this method. So we're really delighted here because Leora, um, many people know that uh, Mia was an integral figure in that very formative and exploratory time in Moshe's life and in, even in your own life since about when, when you were about 18 months old and that you had a household that was enriched by um, such a, a fabulous, uh, eclectic mix of people and visitors who influenced and collaborated with Moshe. And as far as I understand, it was a very creative environment. So we would love for you to begin with painting a picture of, of what it was like at that time in your early life and um, how Mia came to meet Moshe and uh, yeah we would if you can just start by taking us back <laughs> to that time it would be great. A long, a long way back. Well, yes. Thank you for having me today. Um, what would you like to know 
mostly? Well, I think um, in the beginning, just the about the the environment. I mean, firstly, how did Mia uh, meet Moshe? How did Moshe come to be in your life? You know, was that because of Mia's connection with Moshe? Yes, well, that's kind of a long story in itself, which maybe one day, um, as you asked me, my mom can tell you herself. Mm -hmm. But my mother um, was an Alexander teacher, uh, you know, the Alexander Technique. She got qualified in England in the Isabel Crick Center um, in 53, I think. And it was actually her Alexander teacher, Sir Charles Neal, who knew Moshe, and my, my parents were in the UK, but then when they came back to Israel um, and Felton Christ was there, he already started developing his method and he wanted an assistant. So Charles Neal introduced him to my mother. He said, this is you know, wonderful Alexander teacher. And I, maybe she'll agree to work with you and help you out with some of your clients and developing the work and so on. Um, and so they, he introduced them. Uh, and actually, initially, my mother didn't want to do it because my brother was just born. <laughs> she was still nursing him. But so Moshe said, you know, they were in our house and then and, and talking. And Moshe said to her, well, just that's my mother's story, right? Um, and I, she's told it many times and I, it's been corroborated. So um, he said, OK, so just um, come and look at what I do. Mm -hmm. And her, sto her, her story, she was already qualified teaching in England in the Isabel Krupp Center, which was the big center for Alexander. Her story is that she came to see Moshe in his little apartment in Tel Aviv, which I can tell you about also, because that was a, a character place in itself. Mm -hmm. And she said she just saw him approach the first client, and she sat back on her chair, and she said, I can't do anything. I'm just going to watch you. And for months she didn't dare touch anyone she just came and watched him and every time he'd see a client he did these private lessons and by the way there weren't any Feldenkrais tables you know I mean everything was improvised everything was new there was nobody doing this I just want you to go back and realize it was like nobody knew this mm. and um and every time he'd finish uh giving a lesson to somebody and the lessons were never more than 20 minutes by the way um, he would say to her, do you have any questions? And then she could ask anything she wanted. And she says she, he, he taught her so well. He was like a mentor, you know, Asian style teacher, like the martial arts where you just have to sort of imitate your teacher. They don't explain anything. And suddenly she found she was working. And they had then these two tables set side by side. What they were were beds, really simple wooden beds with the legs sawed, sawed off basically that was it and chairs you know and so they they worked side by side in that house which was um his mother lived at one end his brother had a publishing a business downstairs then there was this little room I remember it very well and they used to work there so okay. so did the he thing, cut the did he cut the legs off the table oh, himself or? The, but we did improvise <laughs> for example rollers um so my grandfather uh, who was also a pretty amazing guy, and well, an amazing person, one of the founders of the state, but he was also the editor of the first newspaper in Israel. In Israel. And in Israel. So mm -hmm. for rollers, they used the newspapers, you know, the papers used to be rolled up on these big, big rollers, wooden things. Those were the rollers that initially uh, they used. Foam rollers and all that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you wanted to and ask something, maybe? Well, it's oh, it's fascinating. I think uh, that you know having some of this history that that none of us really have heard before. But could you you know obviously it it also started to you you also built your own relationship with Moshe or you were right. influenced by Moshe. You've talked a bit about you know him being in your house and and growing up as a child the sorts of the sorts of exactly. interactions that you that you had with him. Could you talk a little bit about? Um, uh, your relationship with Moshe and, and, you know, what sort of age you were when you, you two started to connect? Definitely. Well, it all happened at once. So as soon, from the first time that he came to our house with Charles Neal, and 
by the way, he was relaxing in an armchair in the garden. And I, as, as an infant or toddler, I took a hose and sprayed him up and down with water. <laughs> he was relaxing there with his cigarette. You know, he was smoking cigarettes all the time. Apparently I drenched him, but he didn't have a family, a children, right? He had an, a nephew and, and the children of his friends, which I'll tell you about, but we had a very big house on the beach with a cook and a huge garden. And it was very open. My mother is this most relaxed person in the world. And so, and very much living in the moment. My mom, she can't plan ahead, but she really lives in the moment. And I think that's why he chose her because there were a lot of people who wanted to work with him and he didn't want them. He chose Mia. Um, and so the, this, it was a very welcoming house and it was a great place for him to also bring all his buddies and all these interesting people. And so he was basically always in our house, except when he was working with my mom in his basement in Tel Aviv or teaching at Alexandria and I, where he'd take me because he, he had a very avant-garde psychology. And I want to talk about that in a minute too, because the whole household was about that. So my parents, although my father had a very British education, my grandparents were also very, my grandmother was educated in the Sorbonne and in Switzerland, very sort of traditional. Um, polite and all these things, but very explorative, very effervescent, very interested in everything. And that was Moshe. That Moshe, the way that people see him now from these tapes from Amherst when he was already old and cranky, that's not the person. He was funny. He was interested in everything. He was exploring all the time. As children, we'd be playing all day long with these avant-garde ideas. Moshe in the 20s and 30s, that Moshe Feldenkrais lived in Paris, you know, at that time, think about what was there. Marcel Duchamp, you know, all the artists and these, and people who were um, challenging conventions, but challenging conventions, not in the way that now people are just too rude or something like that, always balanced with having really grounded education. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole thing in the house. It was about where do you look for the spiritual, so to speak, although I can tell you Moshe hated that word and he just used to make fun of spiritual discussions. He, he, he taught us his children. He'd, uh, he'd make all kinds of jokes about it, but he was very interested, as you know, in, in Asian philosophies, in Gurdjieff, in um, you know what is the martial arts and where that comes from because you know he established the first judo school in in France mm -hmm. um, and we did all these martial arts and what's the philosophy behind it and and also where do you where do you break the conventions so always looking at both sides so on one hand he'd sort of mock our school teachers because he'd say He'd, he'd mimic really well and stand up and pretend he's a lecturer that's just really boring and talking to himself. On the other hand, he was really interested in, in doing our homework with us. He did all my science homework with me. And the way that he did it with me is not to just say, okay, you know, here's, here's a formula. How can you figure it? You know, how can you learn it? It's like, how can you figure it? How did the person that came up, how did Pythagoras come up with this, with this formula? Like, don't just accept it because the teacher told you. Mm -hmm. So everything had these sides. Oh, you write really well with your right hand. Can you do it with your left hand? And, and he was always exploring and experimenting for himself with new things. So we'd be sitting and talking all day long. There were these conversations about what makes a human human. What is this ingredient that is different from being a dog or a horse, you know? What, what is it and therefore what is the potential and how do we reach it? So he'd be experimenting and he's like, okay, if the only way we can access this is through the body because that's what communicates to the brain, which is what we do, right, with this work. Okay, well, he'd just lie on the floor and try something out or grab one of us, you know, we'd be playing in the mud outside, we'd be running through the living room and he'd grab me and try something. And so just, you know, should we do this? Should we, it was, 
I'm sitting like this. Hey, why don't you sit on this side? Why don't you sit on that side? Oh, here's the coffee table. Lie for a minute. I want to try something. It was just this ongoing and incredibly creative situation mm-hmm. into which I'm just going to go on with one more second. Remember that what exactly what Kim just asked me was this multi, multi-level multi influences because he'd bring scientists, the Weizmann Institute. So the Weizmann Institute in Israel is a very high scientific, very sophisticated place even now. He used to work there before he went off and did his own thing. So he had a lot of friends from there. They used to come to the house and discuss philosophy of science. I took a lot of classes at Stanford afterwards in philosophy of science. You know, science and philosophy are very close. So what is it that makes the groundedness and the imaginative, where's that line? Mm. So he'd bring these people in. He'd bring in um, the premier actor in Israel, the sort of um, Shakespearean actor we had for the Hebrew language in, in Israel. His name was Aaron Maskin, was his best friend. They were neighbors in Tel Aviv. And he had a son my age. So they used to come over. His wife was an artist. So then there were these actors. Then we got really friendly with the London Symphony Orchestra. And they used to come. And, and, and the basketball team afterwards, and my brother was older, the Israeli team, the Maccabi Tel Aviv, was the champions of Europe. But wow. they were, yeah, so Maccabi you, Tel Aviv. It's, it's such a rich tapestry. I mean, it, it sounds like you were, you were really immersed in, an, in, in, a, in a rich, multifaceted experience. And I'm curious, how do you believe that shaped you, Mia? It, as a, I mean, you were a child, then you were an adolescent, a teenager and, and a young adult. And it sounds, it sounds to me just in listening to you speak that it has shaped some of the decisions that you made. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, it was an incredible household um, because it's not only that these people would come to the house, but they became part of this experimentation. So he was learning at the t- same time as he was just discussing and developing the work. So the way that it shaped me, it's very hard, you know, you have to take a step back. Um, it was extraordinary. And remember also that when I was 12, my parents decided to just up and go to Japan, right? Because of the judo. So we had the first dojo in Israel. My parents converted downstairs to a dojo and brought tatami from Japan. I mean. The first yogi who came to Israel came to our house. So everything I did, it was just this always questioning with respect. And if you think about this work, this is a work, this work is a system of questions. Mm -hmm. We don't come and and fix things and say we have the answer. The the most effective work that we can do in this particular, what they call now the the Feldenkrais work and we call mind-body studies, it's because that's what it was. It was a, always studying the mind and body connections and exploring with them. So if I come to, the, to a client, if you want to be really effective, if you're a practitioner, you need to always clean your filters. If you come in and you say, I need to fix this or have them move like that and, sit, and, and think there's a correct way for them to be, Yes, you bring a lot of knowledge, but you also bring your own limitations. You can't help it. If you come to them like it's a whole new world, like we came to every day was all about experimenting and playing with it. If you, if you put your hand on, it's a difference if you even try to put your hand on yourself and say, I'm going to fix it or relax it. It's very different than if you say, I'm here to pick up information. I'm here because I'm curious. What can I learn? Mm. What can I find out? It sounds like that embedded curiosity that you experienced in your childhood, that that, that was Moshe. And, you know, when we watch some of the material from the, the tapes from Amherst or we try and um, digest some of the material from the transcripts from the AY lessons, for instance, the Alexander Yanai lessons, um, I, I don't think we get the sense of aliveness that you're giving us here and the richness of the whole person of Moshe. And um, I'm interested in a couple of things. I suppose one thing is um, 
that the judo, like that your parents established the the judo dojo in in was that in Tel Aviv, um, and then went on. Was that my question? Is from was that led by Moshe? Was it Moshe that led them into that interest of judo? Yes, yes, yes. We used to do judo in the garden. I have a video of Moshe doing judo with me in on the grass, right? Um, it was just part of what we did. But what's important about the judo is the philosophy of judo. That's mm -hmm. why all the movements that we do, all these egg wire movements that you do, mm -hmm. it's actually the idea that's important. That's why we build our classes around principles, mm -hmm. simple principles, learning from differences, distribution of work, coming from another direction. Judo, what it gave me, as a, as a young woman was, first of all, Moshe taught us how to be aware of everything around us. So it really developed our peripheral vision. He used to sit with me in a cafe and say, look at these people in the street and learn to see who they really are, what they're really feeling by the way that they stand and walk. Mm -hmm. And first you start, because this developing your sensory, your visual acuity, something that we do in our classes but that that really portrays to you how the the body and the identity of the person are one and so mm. you can start from the most extreme ones and i give these exercises to my students just for their leisure time but as a child he'd say like everything was always this the world was a, a laboratory right mm -hmm. but i'll give you an example and even those who are just listening in words if you see somebody whose posture is completely in, you know, folded forward. So sort of more or less like going to the fetal position or something, you know that fetal position is like synonymous with being in stress, but it doesn't have to be to that extent, right? The more you learn to see it, the more you can see small cues. But if you see somebody walking in the street and they're looking down and they're hunched over, definitely they are portraying, exuding, communicating a different thing than somebody who's you know standing looking up at the sky right or, or or looking around them so already if you put so he'd say to me look at these people in the street and put yourself in that posture and notice what you feel because that's what they're feeling mm -hmm. so already there's this communication first of all of empathy learning to identify which is so important and also to be so clear systemically about the connection between every single configuration in your body. Like even if one shoulder is higher than the other, how is that? Or if your weight is on one side, you'll find that some people, if you ask them to be creative, they'll shift their weight. I mean, everything is connected to where you go to the brain. And when I was six years old, he told me there were stem cells in the brain and the brain was always renewing itself. At that time, remember that until 20 years ago, mm. everybody said you're born with a certain number of cells in the brain and then they die off and that's why old people forget things. That's, that was what they learned. Mm. And after he died and I was already doing research at Stanford University in the 70s, the, the first fMRIs came in, the functional MRIs. Mm. And Prove brain plasticity became a whole thing and stem cells in the brain. And I'm sitting there going, I can't believe this. Like I knew this. He told me this 30 years ago. Mm. It's interesting that he's been described as a, a true polymath and the, the way he was able to integrate and explore uh, ideas from the other people who came into his life. Um, you know, some of those people I'm just wondering, did you, did you ever meet um, I'm not sure about the timeline of the of the lifeline of these people, Gurdjieff or Alexander, uh, but they were very very formative for Moshe, and he was able to. Um, I'm hearing that you know he was speaking to about stem cells, but he was um, putting together ideas and taking taking I suppose the ideas of people. And there must have been so many rich discussions taking place well, in in the fifties it was different than in the 60s and 70s you know life so in the 60s there was this whole movement when we came to america first because my my mother worked with moshe 
They were by themselves for 16 years or so. Then we went to Japan. So he started training some other people because he was just like, oh, maybe, you know. And he actually wrote to my mother letters where he described those trainings for, you know, Haba and Gabi and all these second generation, um, which was very different from what he did with Mia one-on-one -on -one all the time and in mm -hmm. our home. So then he came to Japan to be with us. And they oh, okay. Met, yes. I didn't he, realize that. So he, yeah. He came to Japan and it was really interesting. So let me tell you about the people you asked. Mm. So there were a few people. First of all, in Japan, there was this man called Noguchi. I don't know if you heard of him. He was a big guru. Like he used to teach movement classes in auditoriums, stadiums, stadiums. Um, thousands of people. He was married to a Japanese princess. I mean, there's a series of interviews that somebody did that I can connect you with that um, because a lot, he has a lot of followers still. He now died, but that was really interesting because he had thousands of followers and um, used to have, he was married to this princess. They had a palace in Tokyo and he used to have these amazing parties, but amazing parties. And he believed in, in, in energies and all kinds of things, just a whole story in itself. But somebody invited my mother to one of his parties and he saw her from across the room and the same thing happened to her that happened with Moshe. He said to one of his assistants, who's this woman? She does what I do. I want to meet her. And, mm. and he started teaching my mother as well when we were there. And then my, when Moshe came to Japan, she introduced him to Moshe and they worked on each other. And Mia's the only person who worked on both of them. And I knew Noguchi. He was very interested in classical music. He had this amazing place he used to work in, always Western classical music. And he was crazy about music. And I told you that we knew the London Symphony Orchestra and all kinds of musicians. When they came to Japan, I organized chamber music in his house for his parties. We used to have it. So that's the kind of crazy people. Um, but then when we came to America, so there was Virginia Satir, she was the mother of family therapy, you know. So I knew her very mm. well. She actually lived nearby where I am now. I knew her well. Milton Erickson, the mm. hypnotist. Mm. He spent a lot of time with Milton. Um, Ida Rolf. Uh, Margaret Mead came to meet him. We were always there. It was, these were the kind of people. Um, no, Alexander was already uh, died and Gujif before that. But I was told to read Gurdjieff, which I still find really hard reading when I was, you know, as soon as I could read it. It was just like, what? Um, so all these, these philosophies and sciences, remember I told you, he used to do all my math homework with me. And it was really interesting because Mia, like, as I told you, is very much in the moment. My mother is into fun right now. This is it. <laughs> I'm the opposite. I'm suddenly totally responsible, right? Why did I write the book and she didn't? And he was too close to really zoom back and look at distilling it into the, into the blueprint. That's mm. what I had to do. Um, and Ben-Gurion, of course, our first prime minister in Israel was a student of Moshe and then my mother. And I used to go with my mother to Ben-Gurion's when she'd give him a lesson, I think, at least four times a week. Mm, it's very and, frequent. Mm. And let me tell you something really important, which I know you're interested in, is that the Weizmann Institute scientists, so these very, very big scientists, and um, Ben-Gurion wanted to establish um, an institute in Israel um, that would proliferate the work, but mostly to develop a program for school children. And it was proposed by the prime minister in the Knesset, our Senate, and it was turned down. The opposition was a very strong movement at the time. And just because they were the opposition, they turned it down. So, so Ben-Gurion took me aside. He said, look, this is what happened. I was like, maybe, maybe seven or eight. He said, you're the only child who's growing up with this. You're going to have to do this. Mm. And I'm still working at it. I can tell you, it's not that we're not there yet, are we? Yeah, that's so. It's it's just amazing. Um, you know, I wonder how how do you feel about that? Do you feel that? Do you feel it? It's a burden carrying this legacy, or do you feel it's a a joy? It's you've been, um, I suppose, exposed to this amazing uh, 
rich Feldenkrais training for the whole of your life, really. But um, and the these amazing powers of observation. But do you do you 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 seem to have a passion and an affinity and a, a really strong resonance with the whole work. And uh, you know, I'm wondering how how Moshe would feel about you today. And I suppose there's another question in there. Did you ever sort of rebel against it or have you always followed a kind of linear path to where you are now? First of all, of course, I rebelled against it. I was a teenager through this thing. And I'm actually really glad because I never saw Moshe as like a teacher or a guru. He was just this really annoying uncle in my house, right? So I think that it's really... I, I, I did not want to do this work. I thought, okay, it's magic. He's got a gift. My mom has a gift. I never do this. It's just annoying. I don't want to be a therapist for sure. And, and I'm really not. Um, I mean, I can do the work, but I knew that, okay. I knew I could question everything because he taught us it's a system of questions. And I'm very glad because he was skeptical about things and challenged conventions and taught me to challenge him. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what he got out of being in our house. There were children, there were all kinds of people and athletes and things like that. And he had to convince us and we could argue against him. And until now, every time I teach this, I mean, my way is to say, if anybody can prove otherwise, like here's, I'm going to give you this, you know, idea to try out. If anything I say doesn't make sense, please convince me otherwise I'm happy you know like let's check it out together and so I did that to him and that was really good because I find that this guruism is a really scary thing and that's why I'm calling it mind body studies and I felt in Christ because it's not about a person like math isn't about one and one is two it's just it is so what we're trying to do is 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 make it so it's so accessible and simple because it really is so and you wanted to ask me if it's a burden or not it has two sides Mm -hmm. so on one hand yes I felt incredibly privileged because it also gave me tools which is what why it's so important for me to share it with children so many aches and pains and, and 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 mental stuff can be prevented if people just knew a little bit of how much we are connected and because the mind and the body and the whole body is connected in so many different ways, you have so many keys into changing it to what you want, you know, changing your state, your physical and mental and and knowing that you are you, Mm. all your potential, right? Because when you start, when you put young children in very hard shoes, you are immediately blocking so many nerves that are have just as much can pick up as much information as your hands you know people that don't have arms can do everything with their feet they can write they can cook they can they can do everything paint but we block that off immediately so if you if you allow that to always stay within your awareness you always literally have more of yourself and that's Mm. so empowering i'm hearing there's a responsiveness to the environment and um from being a child growing up you obviously have a a really deep feeling that this work is really valuable um, for children and in how they they can relate to their environment more as as whole whole beings the thing is if we can keep this this part of being children because we're always learning and we're all children the thing is that a lot of adults, I mean, you must know, there's so many people, I see them like completely crooked and in pain, and I know I can help them. And even if I hint, they just don't take it on. They don't believe that it's simply possible or possible in a simple way to make a change. So yes, I felt the burden of it. I felt extremely privileged, which kind of made me feel guilty. So, I mean, all these things said, I've, I've got to share this and there's too much of it. Mm. That's for just me, right? I mean, what a, it's, a, it's a waste. And that's why I've always worked on building teams, working together with people, you know, just, just sharing it. There's such a wealth. 
I think it's an amazing um, it's an amazing offering, and the way you speak. I mean, it's it's interesting the the congruency, I suppose, about um, Mia has given Mia Siegel has given interviews uh, just more recently, and then even just coming onto the podcast here, where we're opening up conversations in this domain. Um, is there something about sort of today, today's society, you know, or what you can see in the future that has has led you to, um, I suppose, to Mia to speak more or to speak now? Um, because for a long time, you know, I've read the, the big biography of, um, I haven't read it fully, Mark Reese's biography of, uh, of Moshe Feldenkrais, and I was looking for parts about Mia Siegel, parts about <laughs> Leora thinking there could be a decent chunk in there. There's not, there's not a lot. So a lot has remained private for a very long time. Um, so is there something about the climate today that's encouraging you to speak out more? Um, I think it's more that, that Mia's finally agreed to do it. So she didn't write anything or ever. And I can tell you why. Um, and, and also, as I said, Mia's always in the moment. She never could think ahead. That's why Moshe trained me to do the much more, um, how can I say, cognitive, you know, to, to understand how things are put together and how he built his work and how every ATM is actually the DNA of the ATM and the FI are the same thing. And it's, it's like, like a, a, a musical piece where the key and the first few chords determine basically the entire symphony. So just the structure of it, he wanted me to understand that. And that's why he did all my science work with me. Now, the reason that, so, so I wrote and, and documented and, and crystallized all this and formulated it, took all their work and, and I looked at it through these lenses of what's, what's a common denominator, not only of all the work they did, but how that also pieces of NLP, right? Cause I'm an NLP trainer actually, and, and Virginia Satir and Milton, Erickson and I know how all these things actually have a common denominator. Mm. So what are the, the bare bones and we can pass them on as it's, it's like saying, I'm not going to give you a fantastically cooked, you know, salmonier. I'm going to just teach you how to fish, you know? Um, but Mia uh, didn't want to do that. So we were always fighting about that, which was probably quite good that we were always pulling against each other. <laughs> I didn't get to, you know, so I also didn't get to, how can I say, dry with it. And, and my, my grandfather, as I told you, my mother's father uh, was a, one of the people who established the state. As I told you, he was the first editor, but he also was the legal draftsman. When the country was established, he wrote all the laws for the new state because he spoke, you know, seven languages. Um, and he knew Moshe very well, of course, everybody was always in the house. But because of his background in, um, in the press, with the newspapers, there was this whole thing about be careful of publicity. And also we came from a, a very European background, you know, you didn't stand out, you didn't advertise yourself, you didn't, you didn't just didn't market stuff. Mm. Um, it, it was very different. I mean, when we came to America in 70 something, when they started this training in San Francisco, right? My mother and Moshe came together. After one summer, the students said, came to them and said, we formed a guild and we have the copyright on all your name and you can't even use it without our permission. And they're like, what's a copyright? What's permission? Like, what's a guild? <laughs> it was just like not even there. So we went into that. There was a kind of, let's not, put ourselves forward. It's not, it's just not classy, you know? In, that, I mean, in that old fashioned way of thinking, right? Today, you have to do it. So now we've come through a whole evolution of this whole thing. And I think that one of the things that has happened now, so first of all, my mother is 91 going on 92. Mm. She's still teaching, she's pretty amazing, but we had COVID and she suddenly had to start teaching on Zoom. I, I, we started teaching courses on Zoom way before COVID. We, we saw that teaching 
a third of the training on Zoom was really good because we could see the students regularly every other week and they could practice at their own time. I mean, we meshed it and it worked great. Mm -hmm. So, but she didn't want to do that. But Zoom, now she cannot escape. I mean, it was great. She started doing it and she can reach people all over the world three, four times a week. And she's loving it. And so now they want her story. And so mm. she started telling it. And this is just, thank yeah, God, some, right? Thankfully. Something about the connectivity of, of the internet uh, that's, that's managed to bring this full circle. Yes. Yeah, it's really, um, I know that you've you actually said to us earlier, you know, that this is a huge body of work and uh, to, to bring it to the world, you know, what, what more do you think we, we need to be doing to, to be, um, I suppose, further, furthering the, either the develop, what do you want to call it, the development or the evolution or the spread of the Feldenkrais method? Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think the first thing is to, to clarify how simple it is. And, you know, universal truths have to be simple. So to show, to be able to bring to a very, to a public that has a very short attention span and people who just want to feel a bit better, you know, you can't, if I say to somebody, you know, do you want to create awareness of yourself? And I mean, it's too big for them. So to really make it, make it simple and very condensed with, but not diluted right? Because you can simplify something and dilute it. And I'm talking about taking a huge pot of soup and making it into a bouillon, you know what I mean? Or, or taking an essence of, of a field of lavenders and making it into a drop of oil. And that is the essence that we want to give. And that might be this little example that, that I can show you now if we have time to talk about it. Um, so I think these two things is bring something really simple that's fun and interesting um, and, and, is, and it's a system of questions. So it just triggers people to ask about themselves because what more can you give a person than if, if you can give them one little piece, new piece to learn about themselves, how many times in a year, do people actually get to do that, right? And we do it with every lesson. Just learn something new about yourself, which is well, exciting. What do you think, so, Kim? Oh, yeah, yeah, what do you think, Kim? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in a couple of things, actually. One is, um, and I think you've started to touch on this, is how, how, is, how are the mind-body studies, how is that different from other explorations of the Feldenkrais method? That's number one. And, and then number two is you did touch on perhaps we could do a, a small experiential exercise and that would give our listeners a taste of, of, um, of what it is that you're so passionate about. Uh, sure. Are we, how much time do we have? Uh, we've got about, oh, don't worry about the time. We've got about 15, 15 to 20 minutes, yeah. Max. Yep. yep. Okay. So first of all, the difference you'll see by what the little demo that I'll do right now, um, the way that I see it, is that think about if somebody wants to learn about music and you put them in a wonderful concert hall and play symphonies to them all day long. That's kind of what I see is happening in the guilds. So you do ATMs and ATMs and ATMs and ATMs and then what, right? And then they teach you FI, which seems, I think, um, you know, just, I don't know if you can connect it even to what you did on the floor. So, and then I think if, if I want to teach somebody about music, yes, I want to play beautiful music, but I want to explain to them what each instrument does and have them hear that. I want them to know a little bit about theory. I want them to know what's a, a chord and a discord. I want them to know what the conductor does. Like, I just want to give them some framework in which to put this, the files that it starts to make sense out of it. So here's the example I want to give you. And actually, in the modules that we want to offer now, um, that will start in January, this is the kind of thing where after every hour, you have a new skill and a new insight of, of what it is. So here's 
something very simple. When you say, we look down and up, right? We say, yes, we look down, we look up at all kinds of things. And we also look around, right? To look over one side and look over the other side. And if you ask people to do that, and anybody who's listening, if you do this, you notice that most of the movement happens in the neck, right? We want to look up and down, we move the neck. Maybe some practitioners already know that they move a bit more. And this is a really interesting thing because why is the movement, if we want to walk, look around, we're using the smallest vertebrae, weakest vertebrae, on top of which is the heaviest organ we have. And when we look, want to look down and up, we just work that, right? And part of it is language. So, you know, everything in life is in that double-edged sword. Language has divided us into parts. So you, people know there's a neck and then there's a chest, which literally chest, in some languages, it's a basket. In some languages, it's a cupboard. It's just put as a box. So subconsciously, this is how you operate. And then there's your lower back. And that's about it, right? The thing is, it's all one chain of, of, of blocks. So when you look down and you look up, notice, and that's, you know, a very known ATM, how far down your body does it go? And, you know, Moshe was really sure that if people did all these ATMs, eventually, just like with martial arts, the way it was taught in the old days, it seeps into your systemic consciousness. And he was sure that by, you know, decades uh, into his work, it would change collective consciousness, but it didn't, it didn't. And if you mm -hmm. think of things like mindfulness and yoga came later to the West and, and Pilates and all of these, they caught on much more. And this is, in my opinion, so much more effective because it, it's not instead of, but it adds to everything you do. So, okay, so let's just put it this way. You need to explain these things to people. And that's what we do differently in MBS is we, we say, okay, we're gonna feed you with a spoon. Okay, so here it is. You look down, you look up and it's the neck. What makes us decide to only overuse these parts of our body? And you notice that the, the places where people have the most pain are these places, the neck and the lower back. Why? because the distribution of work is completely uneven. So you overuse these, these parts bef, be above the chest and below the chest because the chest is held. And the places between where you overuse and you block, blocking, not moving is a huge doing. It's not that you don't do, you block. It's, it, you have to stop it. If I take, um, this book, and I go like this, the whole thing twists. But when people turn around and they only use their head and they, the, the shoulders don't move, there's a conflict between the places that move. It's like a community. Some people want to go somewhere, the others don't, and there's a fight there. And same in the lower back. So the first thing is, so in a little exercise that I can give a public, I can say, look down and look up. We do this all day long. You can do it in sitting, you can do it in standing, you can do it sitting on the floor. And then of course it stops somewhere in the shoulders. So then you say, okay, leave that. Now feel the contact of your, of your pelvis with the chair where your sitting bones are. And are you in the middle? And is the weight the same on the left and right? And now shift your weight to the tailbone and then forward towards the front. And notice that when you do that, when you shift back to the tailbone, the back gets longer and the front gets shorter, right? Places in front come close together. And when you, when you tilt back and places in the back, the tailbone goes away from the head. And when you go forward and arch your back, so there's a dialogue between your sides. Right, and then you can feel how far up your body does it go. And of course, when you breathe in and when do you breathe out, how is this connected to breathing? So you start to bring a little more pieces into this, into this function. Now, since some people still don't get it, 
you say, okay, so you notice your breathing, you notice the weight on the chair, and you also noticed when you look down and up. When you look down, the chin comes to the chest, but the back of the head gets away from the, sh from the shoulder blades, for example. Now do it all together. Tilt your pelvis to your tailbone and look down at the same time and notice the whole back gets long and the front gets short. And when you tilt forward, the front gets long and the back gets short, right? So again, there's a dialogue. Now, when you go either direction, so let's say you go forward, think of all the places that get close together and notice your breathing. So the chin comes to the chest, we're going back first. The ribs in front get shorter, the chest gets softer. And that's why it's so much easier to breathe out then because you're taking all the air out of your lungs and the weight goes back to the, to the tail. When you go forward, which are the places that get close together and which go far apart? So again, what's the dialogue between the sides? And what, and yeah, go slower. So, so Kim, notice again, when you go back, what do you do with your chin? And what may stop there for a minute? Just stop where you are. What, stop, no, as you are. What made you decide to stop there? What happens with the shoulder blades, for example? Are they going away from each other or towards each other? And then when you go forward, can you feel what's happening? If, and, and the, the cherry on top is, wait a minute, sit on the middle, notice your breathing and all of that. The last question is, and this is like three minutes, right? Look down and notice that everything folds forward, right? You get softer in front, you can breathe out, the weight goes back. Where are your eyes? Wait, 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 don't, don't hurry. You're in a hurry, Libby. Where are your eyes? Are you looking down or the eyes? closed but even when they're closed are you looking down are the eyes following your head or leading your head or with your head what are you doing with your eyes and then when you come forward what do you do with your eyes are your eyes with your head or leading and notice the difference what's the difference when you try to lead with the eyes and how does that change the movement and the whole of the function now from the top of your head to your pelvis, how is that connected with the breathing, with the eyes and with what gets short and what gets long? Right? It really feels, um, so just can wait you really one pay one. attention to that? Yeah, it, it's a system of questions, right? All I did was ask questions. And if you stand now, you'll notice where you are, even if you sit, where your middle is. And if you feel when you look at the horizon, the, it actually changes your orientation in space. Same when you turn around. Now, we didn't do the turning around, but again, you can always ask, how far down does it go? Where does the weight go? And where, what's with the eyes? Now, the, the, actually, the important piece here is yes, we feel great in the body and we've connected the body, which is the first, because there's the, 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 the function of the body where I want people to understand that they are, there's a whole configuration and it can help each other, right? You added the eyes, it helped. You added the pelvis. It, 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 you need to work together like a community. Distribution of work makes sense. But what's really important here is what I told you before. When you see people in this curled up position, if you see somebody in this posture, it's usually because they're in themselves. They're either thinking of something very intense or they're sad. Like the people, when, when people are crying, all the emotions, laughing, because when you do this, remember when I said, what's you with your breathing? If you breathe, if you put your hand on your chest and breathe out, it goes, the chest goes down, right? That's the crying and laughing. It's very connected to emotions, letting out breath. But so if you ask people to think of something sad, this is what they do. They go like this. It's, you can see it's really instinctive for you to, to, to see me like that. If, if you ask people to think of a happy thought, 
How many times have you seen somebody say, say, let me see? And they look out, they look up. Now that's really interesting because physiologically, when your eyes go up, the visual cortex is stimulated di the direct line. So people store all their happy thoughts in pictures, literally, you know, you make pictures in your head, right? When I, and I say, let me see, people are actually looking for the picture or to create a picture. So these postural states are directly, genetically wired in with emotional states. And that's what I think is, is a really nice particular edge here is that if you know that, and you know it's connected then to where your weight is on the chair or on your feet if you're standing, to how you're breathing, to if your shoulder blades are away from the spine or towards the spine, or if you're breathing out or in, or if your eyes are down or up. If you get into a state of mind, an emotional state you want to change, you've got all these keys from any of those because, if, because it's all connected and we've given the message how it's all connected. If I am in a scared state and I want to change it, it's no point for somebody to say, oh, relax, it's okay, relax, relax. It doesn't help, it just makes you crazier. But if you say, well, shift your weight forward or look up, you know, <laughs> it already changes the configuration. Yeah. Something or, changes. Yeah. Or even giving people that awareness that when they're feeling down or when they're feeling happy or whatever their emotional state is, to notice what it is that they're doing with their body. And then the more I can notice what I'm doing with my body when I'm in those states, if I want to shift my state, as you say, my psychological or my emotional state, what I can do is I can just do something different with my body, sit backwards or sit forward or look up or, you know, exactly. whatever it is. And, and it's great that you're, it's very exciting that you're working with children but because I that's, think that's, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's why I just said, I'm much more interested in inflexible minds than flexible bodies or the yeah. same thing that he used to say, if you know what you do, you can do what you want. If people are aware of it, that's it. It's knowledge. That's why I'm saying it's not what I want to do with my work. What we do in MBS is we give people tools. We empower each person to know that once you know it, you can't unknow it. Like what I told you now, you know it. You don't have to practice it a thousand times. It's, it's yours. So, so really, so, you know, you were so blessed. All these people that, that, that you had in your life, you know, you talked about Milton Erickson. I mean, not to mention... Dr. Dr. Feldenkrais, but Virginia Satir, Milton Erickson. So it sounds like what you've done is you're really integrating in that MBS journey, you're really integrating the physiological and the psychological, which I think really, really does give, give people some marvelous tools. Um, can I ask what, what role, uh, just moving slightly to, to Mia for a second, what role does Mia play? now within the, the uh, mind-body studies or within the organization that you have? Yeah, we'll arrange for you to speak to her. And what she keeps saying now is that what she, the way that she sees the work is, um, you know, what, they, what you call now awareness through movement. So we invented all these words in my house, but in fact, it started with, in Hebrew, what it is, is refinement, honing of the self, of the ability, of the potential. And that's why she's now interested in taking people who are practitioners and making them into better practitioners so they can spread the work by focusing on honing and more precision in little things. Like what I did with you right now in a few minutes, we actually take, we, we never do whole ATMs. So Mia will take for six lessons with advanced students, mentoring students, it's just one movement. You don't have to do the whole thing. You have to understand the DNA of the thing. Everything else is, is variations on a theme. So where Mia is now is she, if you'd see these mentoring groups, um, she only takes six or seven people at a time for two weeks. Um, and they'll do a beginning of a movement and she'll get them to understand all the elements of it and explore all the elements and show some examples on each other when they get stuck with it to expand your awareness and self-knowledge and ability through exploring this. I mean, if I just know how I'm doing this, 
where I started, it's a metaphor to everything else. Mm. You know, my choice of where I do, where I start, where I stop, what I'm aware of. So that's where she is now into this real precision. Yeah. We yeah. both wow. want to convey the potential inside that asking yourself the right questions, you actually become your own best teacher. What we want to do is empower people to have faith and confidence in themselves. And that's why the fact that it's a system of questions is so important. Mm, so okay. I don't give you, tell you what to do, but I ask you enough questions that it comes from in you and then it's yours. Yes, and I think, um, I think you've answered what I was about to ask you, which is, um, you know, the message that, that, that you want to bring um, so that people, because you talk a lot and you're very passionate about people having a different experience of life. Um, and so I was curious on a, on a final note just to hear, you know, what is the message that you'd like to bring, which I think you've just, you've just been saying there in terms of, you know, giving people a different experience, giving them tools, giving them options, giving them choice, giving them empowerment. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that that you'd, that you'd really like to, to give to people? Yes, I would like, well, you're talking about practitioners or people in everywhere? Um, oh, you can, you can let, let's start maybe, with practitioners and, and let's, maybe let's it's the do same. both. Maybe yeah. it's the same thing. I want you to know that it's very simple that the this look for the simplicity anything that seems too complicated there's something wrong with it is my opinion and and because we are doing something this work i believe told you i rebelled against it for a while which was good because then i could come into it because i saw it was really working um there's the, if it's a universal truth it has to be simple and because it is a groundbreaker, it is a paradigm shifter. It, it's a very different way of thinking. That's why it's taken so long. That's why even though I'm over 60, and so many times I just, I see, you know, it's not, people don't, still don't know about this work or they're doing it in a completely sort of, they've gone off track with it. Um, I still keep going at it because I know it's a paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift is this little example I gave you now, how simply an everyday movement can just make you realize the kind of, of mastery you can have on yourself by just knowing, just information, simple, straightforward, that makes sense. I didn't ask you about contractions and states of mind. All I said is what's getting close, what's getting far, right? When do you breathe in? When do you breathe out? All questions. And let me also tell the practitioners, if you know these questions, we call them in-betweens, they are the key, the questions of the awareness. I didn't ask you a lot of other questions. What about the armpits and the feet and the this and the that? Simple things, close and far, near, you know, short and long or whatever. That's where you're going to put your hands to get the best of eyes. If you put your hands and you look at the ribs, what's getting close, what's getting far. So they, it's all the same thing. So it's very, very simple. So here's my message is, this is simpler than, if you don't see it as very simple, it needs to make sense, question it. If it's not making sense, it's not you. It's, it, it's somebody didn't explain it, right? Yeah. And, and it should be fun. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, um, Thank you. That's a fantastic distillation, Kim. And I think, you know, the, the summary there for me is, is those two points you made, which is keep it simple. And if you keep it simple, you can, you can achieve self-mastery. That's beautiful. Um, I'd just like to thank you, Leora. Uh, we feel Didn't so you, blessed. You just um, add, and remember that it's about questions. So and remember, question yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And, and what a wonderful gift that, that Moshe Moshe gave you is is to question everything you know don't just accept it that that and that that's fabulous so um Leora we feel so blessed to have had you to, to have had this conversation with you today you have so much to offer and I think you know we could we could easily Libby and I have agreed we could easily we could talk for days 
and uh, and we we are hopeful that next year uh, we we may have you back again. I think we could certainly have a part B to this podcast, and perhaps even uh, with Mia as well. Uh, we will when we when we um, when when the podcast is available. Uh, we will also make available your uh, website, which actually is the uh, mbsacademy.org. So it's mbsacademy.org, and there's a lot of resources there as well available for people. But look, just um, uh, wholeheartedly, thank you so much for your time today, and we wish you well. Thank you for having me. You're incredibly refreshing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leora. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.